And right now, it's time to start with our first uh, panel discussion. So I would like to welcome here distinguished speakers, uh, François Schmidt, Mirek Dušek, Johan Schanz, Sabine Veant, and also the moderator, Vanda Kofronjová, to take seats here and to start with discussion. So again, please, speakers of the first panel discussion, yeah, I can see that you are already coming to take your seats. There is no rule when it comes to chairs, so just choose whichever you want. And now I would like to pass the floor to the moderator, Vanda Kofronjová from the Czech television. So please, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Welcome. Good afternoon. Our globalized world faces many problems. We've heard about many of them at the very beginning of this panel, and some of them can be solved by trade and investment. European Union would love to lead the process to be the leader of the change that needs to be seen in the world to a more sustainable and prosperous future. We have seen many initiatives in the last decade, uh, the Global Gateway, to name the one, or uh, trade agreements with other partners, strategic partners, throughout the whole world. But despite of all those efforts, we still lag b behind our competitors, the USA and China. Are European strategies good enough, sufficient? Do we have to change them? Do we need more money? What should we do to build more resilience in European economy? That's our topics for today. I remind you that you can use Slido. We would love this discussion to be really a discussion with all of you. So please ask your question through Slido. And now it's my great pleasure to welcome our uh, special guests. I will, try, I will start from a lady, uh, Sabine Vajant, Director General for Trade of European Commission. Hi, welcome. François Schmidt, analyst from Mercator Institute for China Studies. Hello and welcome. Mirek Dusek, managing director of World Economic Forum. Welcome. And Johan Schanz, senior economist from European Investment Bank. Hello. At the very beginning, I would love to ask you for opening remarks, one each of you, and I will start with uh, Director General Wyant, please. Uh, thank you very much. <coughs> Does this work? Yes. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, I'm very happy to be here in beautiful uh, Prague. I landed uh, late morning, so I just had a short walk on the Charles Bridge, but I, you know, made me want to come back again. Um, but I also, so I landed at uh, Václav Havel Airport, and I had lunch under the photo of Václav Havel. So I thought for my introductory remarks, I should aspire to what he excelled at, which is to express uncomfortable truths uh, with clarity and sometimes also the necessary brutality. So I'll try and do that. Um, so three messages in hopefully three minutes. Um, first of all, I think we have to recognize business as usual is over. We live in a world of multiple crises. We have seen shifts from a rules-based system to a power-based system. The focus is in, in the economy is uh, shifting from efficiency to resilience. Um, and uh, we are moving from a perception of economic interdependence as an opportunity to economic interdependence as a risk. These changes are here to stay. I think we have passed the uh, tipping point on these. So that's the environment we operate in. Second point, there's no room for complacency. We are rightly proud of our internal market, of our single market, which uh, uh, has been uh, this underpinning the strength of our economy. But we have to be very careful that we don't take it for granted. We are currently lagging behind, you mentioned it, uh, in productivity compared uh, with the US uh, in terms of growth as well, uh, which is uh, the ultimate driver of competitiveness. The gap started widening in the early 2000s uh, due to the slower emergence of the knowledge economy in Europe. There are many reasons for that, but the lack of single market integration, notably also the capital market integration, um, and uh, uh, sluggish investment are reasons for that. So we really have to get this right, and I think one of the next key themes for uh, the legislative cycle in Europe will be competitiveness, and that is for a reason. But the solution here should not be to try and copy uh, recipes that have already been tried and failed. 
rampant subsidization, unilateral tariff increases, or generally turning inward, that's not a path that will lead us to growth and prosperity. We don't even have to look back at the 1930s uh, uh, to realize that. Just look at the recent data on the impact of the Trump tariffs on the US economy. These Trump tariffs have not, have not achieved any of their objectives. They have not shored up employment in the US, and they have certainly not uh, helped with addressing the trade deficit. So uh, let's focus instead on our strengths and promote a strong economy at home. That is the part, uh, the, the, the heart of the Green Deal industrial plan, and that's also our long-term uh, competitiveness strategy. And of course, trade and investment policy has a key role to play here. Our strength depends on the strength of the competitiveness of our exports. That is also the pathway to resilience, not just to efficiency and prosperity, but also to resilience. And I think that is something which is not necessarily sufficiently reflected uh, in the discussions uh, we, we are having uh, here. Uh, so from that uh, uh, point of view, uh, we really have some, some work to do. Um, we have rejigged our trade policy quite considerably over the last three or four years on the basis of open strategic autonomy. Um, we still need openness, we also need fairness, and we have equipped ourselves with a lot of instrument to act if our openness is abused. Um, and we are not hesitating to do that, whether we are talking about trade defense instruments or whether we are talking about the anti-coercion instrument, when we are being uh, forced into uh, certain behaviors or try to be forced into certain behaviors. Um, and uh, I think all this requires constant work, uh, and that means continuing to invest in uh, reviving the WTO, bilateral trade agreements, but not just the standard trade agreements, the comprehensive ones, which are difficult to negotiate, but we also need to have more agile instruments, digital trade agreements. That's something the Czech Republic has always gotten right, the insistence on digital, and the, because our competitiveness very much rests on digital, digitally enhanced uh, service provision. So that is something we need to focus on. Um, but the, and then we have new formats of engagement where tra trade agreements are not possible, and that is uh, uh, the Trade and Technology Council with the US, with India. But we need more. And the last point I wanted to make is we are still looking at different policies too much in isolation. And I think that's a luxury we can no longer afford. We need to bring together all policies, industrial policy, um, economic policy, foreign policy, trade policy, investment policy, in a coherent economic statecraft. That is what other actors have been doing for a while already, and it is something that we have to get better at. That is what is behind the economic security uh, strategy, but it is also behind Global Gateway, which you mentioned, where we bring together concrete projects, funding, and regulatory policies in order to promote our collective resilience and prosperity. And I will leave it there. I think it was more than three minutes. Sorry about that. Never mind. Uh, it was well spent time. Uh, Mirek Dushek would be the second one who I asked to uh, share with us his opening remarks. Uh, thanks so much. Thanks for having me. First, congratulations to the organizers. I really like the proactive framing of the of the whole uh, summit. I represent an institution that uh, is based in Geneva, in Switzerland, global in focus, and uh, we work uh, with the public sector and the private sector, and so we work a lot with companies. So if you allow, maybe I could just contribute to this discussion a little bit with the lens of how a lot of the business leaders that we work with from around the world that are either European or are invested in Europe, uh, what are the things that they're looking at um, when it comes to Europe's competitiveness? I just wanted to underscore what you said just now. Also for us, um, uh, post-COVID and, and, and uh, given all the other shocks, we really are in a different world, different economy. And so I think it's really important, or at least the way we look at it, is that when you talk about European competitiveness, you look at it in terms of how that will do in the new global economy. And I'll just elaborate on that a little more, but it's really important that we have that forward-looking lens. Uh, as you elaborated, we also think that uh, the geopolitical, geoeconomic landscape is very different. So uh, the power uh, uh, balance uh, or uh, architecture is changing rapidly. 
it's not set. So people, some people would call this a new era. I think uh, we need to see what that is. Uh, I think it, it's better to say it's a world in transformation. But for sure, I think you're all seeing that things are changing, new partnerships, new coalitions are being formed, new countries are becoming more important maybe than uh, five uh, or uh, 10 years ago. So it's just very important to pay attention to those shifts uh, in the geoeconomic landscape, if you will. But then, of course, if you ask CEOs, of course, top of mind for them, a lot of them have woken up to the geopolitical risk landscape, of course, let's, let's face that. But then a lot of them, of course, pay a lot of attention to technology, and uh, innovation, uh, obviously AI is top of mind for many, but quantum and biotechnology would not be very far uh, behind. And obviously then companies also look at kind of the whole system of nature, climate and energy together. And what does that do to them in terms of what they need to do, but also their relationship with uh, public sector. So either the European Union, uh, the commission, etc., cetera, or, or national uh, governments. And so, uh, how are we doing in terms of if we look at this as a new global economy and how do we successfully compete as Europe in this new global economy? So what are the starting blocks? Where do we start? And I think you hinted at that too with your brutal kind of lens there that uh, it's, I mean, if you read about it, you know that obviously the, for example, the share of global GDP Europe's share has fallen or has been sliding. 1995, it was about 80, it was about 27 percent, now it's about 18 percent. Um, uh, industrial uh, value also, we've been deindustrializing de uh, in in Europe. Um, it's this is something that is not new, but I think it needs to be stated that obviously vis-a-vis -vis the United States and China. Um, Europe um, is, is uh, on par with China now in terms of the size of the economy in nominal terms, but we've been in a better position. In 2008, I think uh, we were roughly the same size as the US. Um, now, if I look at uh, the future, I, what I would like to do, if it's okay, just very briefly look at AI specifically, because it sometimes helps to just look under the hood of what then, what are the drivers of competitiveness and how are we actually doing, um, if you take Europe now, in terms of that specific field. And so people would, for example, look at the supercomputer landscape as kind of the plumbing for the AI race, if you will. Um, and so there um, we have in Finland, uh, Lumi, we have Leonardo in Italy. So some of the fastest, most powerful supercomputers. But if you look at the share of the most powerful 500 supercomputers in the world, uh, and if you look at how China and US and Europe is doing, Europe has the smallest portion of those. Um, if you look at, um, if you look at uh, investment, so this is something that uh, also you mentioned. So in terms of public investment, uh, as you know now, everyone talks about industrial policy. So obviously a big portion of that uh, is also related to the uh, technology space. Um, and so, for example, just as a factoid, in terms of the proportion of GDP, Saudi Arabia leads in terms of the public investment um, landscape in terms of AI. Uh, in, in Europe, uh, just so that we all know, Luxembourg and Slovenia are best in terms of how much government money goes into AI specifically per capita. But I think what is more important is private investment. And so there, the gap, uh, particularly with the United States in Europe, if we, um, on AI, but I think it's then, um, it, could be, um, it could be relevant for other disciplines. The gap is really striking in terms of how much private investment there is in the United States. China is far behind, but Europe is way far behind in terms of private investment AI. The other thing I would mention very briefly is also we think in general, I think we're doing okay on STEM education in Europe. I think it's true, but I think what matters if you're really trying to compete is also absolute numbers. So there, for example, on STEM graduate, uh, the US and China, again, total number uh, much higher. In terms of also the um, research centers, and I'll finish very soon. Uh, in terms of the research centers, also the most uh, high-ranked uh, AI research centers right now in the world, most of them are in the US, 
some in China, Europe, uh, a little behind. So I, I'm, I'm happy to elaborate on this further. I just delved into things where Europe is not doing so well on AI. Of course, there is this huge promise of, uh, of AI now regulation, the new legislative action. But just to paint the picture of how important some of these growth drivers are, they will drive competitiveness overall for actors in the new global economy. And I think it needs to, we need to be clear-eyed about where Europe is and where it needs to go. So that sense of agency is important as well. I'm happy to elaborate on it. Thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Schmitz, I've seen a lot of nodding at the beginning, but then at the moment when Mr. Dushek was talking about the, the education, uh, you seem to disagree. So maybe before you start with uh, your opening remarks, would you share us your thoughts? You don't need to... Uh, Okay, a pleasure to be here. Good afternoon to everyone. Um, no, I was only reacting to the STEM uh, consideration. That's maybe because uh, from a Chinese perspective, so I'm from the Mercator Institute for China Studies, the biggest think tank in Europe on China. Uh, obviously, the comparison is quite striking. China has a tendency uh, to produce roughly 40 to 50% of its high um, education degree in STEM, which is much higher than any European countries, I think. Uh, so this is maybe where uh, I was a tiny bit surprised, but maybe because of my China-specific uh, background. To come back to the general discussion in the um, introductionary remark, um, let me start with the very obvious. Uh, I'm pretty sure everyone is aware of it, but it's good to say it once again. Um, Europe needs the rest of the world to pursue its basic objective. First, to access energy. Either old energy or new energy, Europe does not have the domestic capacity to generate those commodities that produce that energy. Europe needs the rest of the world. By most metric, for prosperity, Europe also needs the rest of the world. There is a discussion on the potential undervaluation of the cost of, of certain costs related to openness. Irrespective of that, no country has been developed and prosperous without opening up onto the rest of the world. Those are the basic elements of the conversation that simply exclude at least some chunk of the possibility regarding trade and openness we might have ahead of us. Um, now, now that we've said that, we've only excluded the most extreme ones, and we have a, still a very significant amount of options ahead of us. Um, and in that regard, unfortunately, I think, for Europeans, reality has challenged our previous collective response, which was openness. By opening up, we were both generating prosperity at home and accessing the goods we needed from abroad and even potentially contributing to secur securitizing our global environment by generating global prosperity. This is no longer the reality or a sufficient response to the reality of today, it seems. Two main challenges have come to challenge that, that balance. First one, and everyone has mentioned it, the geopolitical environment. Non like-minded partners are on the rise. Like-minded partners are either on the decline or diverging from their like-mindedness. <laughs> um, and the second big di divergence is the challenge regarding the environment, where we are falling behind our objective to keep the global warming on track to a sustainable or at least uh, an environment we can survive in as human being. And in that respect, that challenges uh, our response and openness no longer seems like the perfect answer uh, or at least by itself a good answer or a sufficient answer to the challenges of the day. The upside to it is those are common European challenges. And by being common to Europeans, they by definition n naturally generates a, a necessity for more Europe and more common response by Europeans with those challenges. Um, and we are not starting from scratch. Uh, obviously, Europe is a big boat, a lot of inertia in it, obviously, as, as any big boat has. Um, but over the past four to five years, as an analyst on European trade policy, I can tell you, uh, it has been extremely dynamic. Uh, and we have seen um, the European Union iteratively trying to come up with new answers and refining its approach to openness in order to adapt to the challenges of the day. One large element has been around the Green Deal ambition, um, which has 
which is basically Europe going unilaterally, doubling down on its domestic effort to pursue environmental protection, which comes along some stronger effort to prevent environmental leakage because of that greater gap between European environmental efforts and the rest of the world, which is a change of grammar regarding the way we articulate with the rest of the world. It doesn't mean closeness, it means a more complex, a more um, balanced uh, openness. And the other dimension was set, I would say, on track by the discussion around open um, strategic autonomy and, and to date the, the discussion around economic security that has followed through and around the ambition of de-risking our relationship with our non-like-minded uh, partner, first and foremost. Uh, and those has led to a flurry of policy. Uh, and trust me, it has been very difficult uh, to follow and analyze all that. Uh, good job. <laughs> um, we can, we can come back on that. I'm not going to iterate through each one of them. But they have really been, for many, quite, quite revolutionary from a European perspective. Uh, we have developed new instrument. We have beefed up a former instrument. We have been innovative in the way we apply traditional instrument, typically tackling transnational subsidy along the Belt and Road Initiative by the Chinese in a very legally and politically uh, innovative way and that people have, might not have uh, talked about enough to, to, to my uh, impression. Um, but unfortunately, challenges are keep on increasing and keep on accelerating. And, and the geopolitical reality at our borders are unfortunate reminders of that. And so we need to keep on moving ahead. And I think to move ahead, there is mainly three questions we need to ask ourselves. And we need to collectively come up with a new response as Europeans on how, what are our collective preferences in that regard. And the first one is more or not more Europe? And how do we have more of Europe? Where do we need more Europe? How much each European country is willing to let go of its own policy margin in order to, to gain more European leverage to tackle the issue we have ahead of us? This is, I think, a gigantic question throughout the European Union that needs to be, to be addressed. The second one is a reinterrogation of the relation between the market and the state. There has long been a consensus among European towards a very order liberal approach, uh, where basically the state regulate and, and the market operates. Um, this, unfortunately, is being challenged by our partners and begs some, some questions for Europeans. And then finally, regarding trade policy, we have accumulated demands regarding the rest of the world. Be greener, be, be safer, be more like-minded, be better on human rights. But now comes the question of what are we willing to give extra to get to pursue those objectives. And unfortunately, and I think typically the, the difficult uh, negotiation with Australia, with Mercosur, and even with Chile or Mexico, are a reflection of our uncertainty, if not inconsistency sometimes, uh, in the multiplication of the objective we pursue without putting more money on the table, if I, if I can say so. Thank you. Your speech provoked our audience to ask you questions, so <laughs> it was great. Thanks. Um, Mr. Schenz, you represent uh, investment world here, the European investment. Can you share first thoughts with us? Sure. Thank you very much. Thank you very much also to the organizers. Um, I think who seem to have done a tremendous job. I received emails at midnight and, <laughs> and later. It's, uh, it's really very impressive. And I'm um, also very happy to say I'm working for the European Investment Bank. I'm very happy to say that we are once again a partner of this event. Um, and yeah, and I'm, thank you for the invitation. So I, I found it very interesting what you said in your opening remarks because you were emphasizing the need for investment, the need for skills for competitiveness reasons, right? But you can come to exactly the same conclusion if you don't talk about competitiveness, but if you start from the idea that what we need is to bring forward the green transition. Right? This is not possible without uh, lots of investment in green energy generation, in, in uh, replacing the use of fossil fuels through um, green energy, uh, through, through green sources of, um, uh, of fuels, and also to, uh, when it comes to, to improving the energy efficiency of our economies, of our housing as well. So I would like to talk about three, um, three, uh, three points uh, in the following. First, private investment and public investment, and then come back to a point that you all also mentioned, coordination. In my 
you 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 mentioned cooperation in a in a much wider sense, right? Then I will do. I'll come to that in a moment. But it's very important for investment as well. So when it comes to private investment, there are huge investment needs. But what do companies really need for for investment? They need stability. They need access to resources, right, to the investment goods. But they also need access to skills, to people who actually implement those investments and who are able to then operate new machinery and equipment if the investment is in firms. Um, and they also need finance, right? And finance, a, degree, a type of finance that lets corporates retain the combination of risk and rewards that they are comfortable to, uh, to retain. And I think in all of these areas, uh, stability and access and finance, we don't score too badly, at least at the moment. But there are still lots of ways uh, in which we can improve on all of them. And I'm happy to uh, refer later to results from, from one of the surveys that we are doing on the investment intentions, uh, intentions of European firms. So that's private investment. On public investment, I think it's also very clear that we need that. Uh, to bring the green transition forward. Uh, it's not only sustainable transport, but it's investments in skills and education. Um, but it's also investments in, in um, administrative efficiency, right? And in the, in, which is one of the huge obstacles that, uh, that um, corporates tell us they face when investing. It's an administrative efficiency and in some, uh, in some circumstances, um, uh, quick decisions that are uh, done according to the rule of law. So that's something uh, we, we need to work on from a public investment side. And the challenge is here to really create the fiscal space to finance those investments. And public investment is just a small proportion of GDP, right? It's maybe 4 or 5%, a bit more in Eastern Europe. Uh, but it's not a lot relative to social payments, pension payments, and so on. So there needs to be the political will to finance these investments. And the last point I wanted to make, as I mentioned this already, is on the importance of coordination. So when you look at it from a perspective of investments, it's the, pers it's the coordination between, uh, between different uh, sectors, different uh, firms operating in different sectors in the economy and the public sector. And why is that? We are not looking at incremental changes to our economy. If you want to improve the fuel efficiency of a car, you don't need to coordinate, right? You invest in the re necessary research and development, and you will have a successful product. But that's not working when you want to find a completely new structure for your economy, one that is more uh, more attuned uh, with, with the environmental sustainability and which is able to, to slow climate change. There you need coordination. The basic exam example that's always being given is that nobody will buy an electric car if there's no charging infrastructure. Nobody will put up the charging infrastructure if there's no demand from, it, uh, from electric cars. Right? So there's a lot of need for coordination um, here. And maybe the very last point I wanted to make, all this investment in the green transition creates a competitive advantage for Europe in the medium term. Right? So it's good for competitiveness. Why? Because it will lower our energy costs. It will be a positive supply shock for our economy once we've gone through the years of, of transition. Thank you. Thank you. Um I'll pick uh, one of the questions from Slido I received because I think it uh, nicely starts the discussion. Uh, this session highlights a more sustainable economy. How do you define it? What is it? To sustainable economy. And I think it might have something to do with what uh, Mrs. Voyan said at the beginning, that the business as we know it is over, that we need to rethink it. So this, is this the part of sustainable future to rethink the business and how it should be shaped? Yes, please. Okay, then let me let me try and have a first go. Because I realized in my introduction I did not talk about the Green Deal. I mentioned no. it as part of the Green Deal industrial plan, because for me it's a given. It's the, the, the Green Deal is Europe's growth strategy. Uh, the twin transitions are what we base our, uh, uh, what we bet on for our future prosperity. So that's why I, I felt no need to repeat that. But if I'm now confronted with the question of how do we define sustainability, then I think we have to go back to the basics and the three pillars of uh, sustainability, which is economic, which is competitiveness, which is the issue of uh, environmental sustainability. And here it is now essentially uh, the net uh, zero carbon economy um, with everything that that entails because that then also requires acting on biodiversity, etc. But that is, that is the focus that drives uh, uh, the change. But then we also have to look at social sustainability and that is inside societies, 
that is the challenge for Europe and essentially for the member states uh, to get that right, but also between different parts of the world. And there we see that we are also living through a time of transition. And it's not easy to get these uh, three uh, uh, issues, these three pillars of sustainability together. I think I will leave it there. But we need all of them. It's not just Absolutely. the Green Deal that it make us sustainable for the future. No, I think the Green Deal, and that, that's where it all comes together. Yes, climate change is the existential challenge we now face. But we will only be able to tackle it if indeed we can show that by banking on the green transition, by using that as our growth strategy, we can actually create economic growth and competitiveness. And it will only work if the, it is combined with a, a just transition and social fairness. So I think that's it, it's still the overarching theme, but we will only succeed uh, dealing with the existential challenge we have if we have the other pillars there as well. And that is the debate that is currently happening in our societies, because people feel, yes, we, are, we accept that the, the climate is what we need to, to deal with, but they are worried about the economic consequences. Will they have the patience to see that, you know, after, after the hard uh, uh, slog, there will be the reward? I think we have to make sure that we readjust permanently these different pillars in order to keep, uh, 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 to, in order to take people with us in this transition. Mr. Dushek, you wanted to react. No, first, uh, just uh, this uh, adjective, sustainable, obviously, it could mean both related to climate and environment, but it could also... It and the also question means, was, how do you define it? So Yeah, maybe but I think just to say that sometimes uh, also, of course, it's about how are you on a sustainable course overall with competitiveness. I think you described it very well, but just to say sometimes it's a little confusing. People mean different things by it. Um, then if I could just react to the uh, private investment, I think you, you, you said uh, that um, Europe is doing okay. Um, I think that, um, for example, just I happen to have the AI numbers here, so uh, just there because I do feel that um, it is really one of the key growth areas for businesses, for, for, for economies. Um, there, according to, to this, 47.4 billion in 2022 was invested in AI in terms of private investment, China 13.4. So already, the China, the, the the gap with China is huge, and Europe is under 10. Um, again, it may be different for. I think you talked about the uh, the, the the net zero technologies, etc. But just to illustrate, I think that there are certain areas where, uh, through whatever capital uh, deepening capital uh, union, etc., or making it finally work. Uh, I think that needs to be taken very seriously if we are to really compete seriously on innovation in this new global economy. I fully agree uh, with you on the fact that the uh, the net clean energy economy or net zero economy, whatever we call it, is a huge uh, huge opportunity for Europe and for the European economy. Um, now. Having said that, again there, I mean, you all know it, but just to state it, for example, if you look at what the net zero technologies are, so it would be solar, wind, batteries, electrolyzers, heat pumps, just to say a few. And so I think you all know that right now on solar, uh, in terms of the, uh, at least the production, uh, is, is really dominated by, uh, by China. Uh, wind, uh, also um, uh, batteries. So it's really electrolyzers and heat pumps. Where, where uh, Europe now actually electrolyzers are, you know, for for producing hydrogen. Uh, where Europe now is doing quite well, we actually dominate the production right now. And so, if you listen to Mrs. von der Leyen, I mean, she's clear-eyed, clear-eyed on this. That then there are certain measures being taken. How do we make sure that also this doesn't happen to uh, some of these uh, technologies. But overall, I would fully agree that this is one of the growth areas uh, for Europe. And the final point, I would just also like to agree on the social dimension of uh, the uh, transition to, uh, to net zero and to a clean energy economy. 
I think that we've seen it now clearly that there is that thing about how do you bring everyone along. The social dimension I think is super important. If you listen to Shevchovic or others now coming in, having those introductory speeches in the European Parliament, they're quite clear on that. Um, and, and there I think it's really important to think through what the farming communities, the mining communities, and other communities that are dependent on either the production of fossils or, or, or extraction of fossils, or if they are using practices that are actually contributing to uh, carbon emissions. Uh, we saw it in the Netherlands, the huge crisis that we saw out of that political crisis that we are still uh, seeing before us. And so those things, I'm just glad that this is being taken seriously because I think this is, uh, this is kind of the, the final thing that needs to be completed, if you will, on the European Green Deal. And again, from the, from the vantage point of companies, this is also something that they pay a lot of attention to in terms of, of course, some of them may be invested in those vulnerable areas, uh, but uh, overall, I think this is of huge significance uh, also for the private sector. This topic uh, actually triggers our audience a lot because we had a lot of questions about it. I don't want to go too much into details uh, because this should be about investment and trade, but uh, I would love to ask you one more question about the digital economy. Uh, is the risk from the shift to a digital economy best mitigated by trying to win the AI race or instead limit the immense accumulation of power by the companies? Maybe Mr. Rusek, it's uh, again on you because you represent the... Uh, um, the companies here, the, the private uh, money. Um, I, I don't want to uh, dumb, uh, steal your time here, but just very quickly, I think this is a very obviously a very important question. In terms, so the digital economy is expanding. So uh, it, it is something where we are, you know, we, we're seeing more and more of the economic activities in the digital domain. And obviously there is a huge risk around concentration. Uh, and if you followed um, the executive order in the United States, if you follow the discussion in the European Parliament around the AI Act, if you also follow some of the companies themselves, uh, if you just look at the discussion uh, between, uh, on one hand, Meta and others uh, who are advocating for open systems in terms of um, generative AI, and OpenAI and Microsoft and others who may be saying we need to, we need to have, we need to focus more on the uh, uh, other models, the foundational models that are not open. Um, uh, this also is about that. So it, there is a huge discussion right now within the private sector, but also of course with government around what that future looks like. Um, uh, and uh, I think this is something that of course then um, uh, within national boundaries, there will be uh, regulation. The AI Act will also be looking at that. Um, but it is something that is that goes to the questions of, you know, rights as consumers, uh, in terms of innovation landscape, etc. So it's a huge issue, but just super important uh, uh, in terms of particularly uh, where AI will go and Gen AI will go. Thank you for your insight. Um, Mr. Schmitz, I think it was you who said that uh, the EU should be more open, that we need the rest of the world if we want a sustainable and prosperous future. And the question is, uh, open to who, to what, and how exactly it would look like? And maybe it, it would be a question for uh, our other guests as well. Pretty sure. Um, the idea was not necessarily to be more open, but to question the way um, than the framework we have around those openings. And we are demanding more on the rest of the world, and we never demand ourselves what are we willing to give in order to obtain that. Um, and that was very clear regarding the green agenda, but that is now also becoming clear regarding human rights, digital, and also securitization of exchanges. Um, and maybe here there is one question um, related to the previous uh, topic regarding sustainability that has not been addressed. Maybe because it's not directly a European competency, which is, the, let's say, the sustainability in terms of security. I'm setting aside the question of purely defense security, because I'm not an expert in that, and I think it is not uh, the discussion of today. But I am putting forward another question, um, again, um, which is one question that, again, we need to collectively 
address ourselves is how okay are we with the idea that what the American called foundational technology, technology that basically generates productivity gains throughout the economy and especially in the defense industry, um, how are we okay with the idea that those technology might fall in the hands of powers with which we are strongly diverging and strongly not like-minded? We have all lived as European through a long era where those questions were not on the table because the American had the lead and they were like-minded, so we did not have to ask ourselves so much those issue. Uh, but unfortunately, nowadays, and typically in the case of China, this is a question we have to ask ourselves. And how do we respond to that? And that comes to the question of how do we open and with who we, hope it, we, we are open with and where. Um, the simple answer of just we decouple is not feasible, not optimal, and potentially completely is going to completely backfire. Um, so we have more complexity ahead of us, which is exactly where do we agree to engage with not like-minded partner or even systemic rival or confrontational partner, and how do we articulate on those specific areas? How do we articulate with uh, China on AI? China has stuff that we need on AI. Access to data, capacity, technology, a very dynamic consumer market that is actually very innovative um, uh, seeking. Uh, so you have a demand for those products. We need that. How do we articulate with them to get that and minimize the cost for us regarding our preference in terms of human rights, technology leakage, uh, spillover of our technology into the civil military fusion uh, policies that they have to develop their own defensive capacity. And those are typically area where unfortunately, um, despite the pressing needs, we have not come up, I think, with a uh, stable framework of operation. And this is largely because member states refuse or at least are not keen on having those conversations and on really engaging because they are jealous of their own political um, ability to navigate by themselves unilaterally. Mrs. Van, I'm really <laughs> curious about your response. Oh, thank you very much. Actually, I, was I wanted to react to something you said in your introductory remarks, and that is reality is challenging our traditional collective response so far and calling into question our traditional approach to, to openness. But what about if we get the answer to that challenge wrong? And I think we are at risk of that because um, we are all talking. As I said, we are shifting from efficiency to resilience. But if we are interpreting resilience as meaning that we are better off closing ourselves off to the world, and there are tendencies like that in other countries but also inside Europe, then we will pay a very hefty price for that, not just in terms of prosperity and efficiency, but actually in terms of resilience. Are we not learning the wrong lessons? I go back to the pandemic where the knee-jerk reaction to the shortage of protective, personal protective equipment was, let's keep everything to ourselves, yeah? uh, let's not share, let's not export. Um, with the benefit of hindsight, we saw that the only effect of the export restrictions was to drive prices up even more and to make scarcity even more problematic. And there are OECD studies that have shown that longer, more diversified supply chains are much better than trying to reshore. And, you know, we tried to get mask production back to Europe. I think there was a lot of taxpayers' money spent on that. But then everyone went back to buying cheap Chinese masks uh, when they became available again. So I think we also have to be very careful about what are the lessons we learn. Uh, so uh, uh, from that point of view, um, I think we have to be careful that we get the balance right between efficiency and resilience, and that we accept that we cannot achieve resilience on our own. We need to have collective resilience. And that means that we even have to work with those who are difficult and not like-minded partners. China is a challenge. You know more about that than I do. Um, but at the same time, we cannot look at the uh, China challenge just through the lens of where do we have to uh, reduce critical dependencies and uh, 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 sever links, de-risk instead of, of, of decoupling? That's the right approach. But we are at risk of exaggerating the dependencies we have, and we lose sight of the dependencies that China has on the EU. 
we are constantly underestimating our strength in this. We do have action, uh, we, we do have agency in this respect. It's a very small part where we really have dependencies. Uh, some raw materials, a few ingredients in pharmaceuticals, pharma, but that's it. Most of the trade is not risky. So we should be very careful to shut ourselves off from what is a source of growth for us as well. But just as well, China needs to be careful. Let's also not forget that China was uh, getting into the decoupling game first with their dual circulation uh, uh, philosophy, uh, where they basically were aiming for autarky in important sectors. But I'm really a little bit worried that when we talk so much about resilience, we lose the reward. I mean, we have to look at risk and reward and resilience together, um, because otherwise we are cutting ourselves off and shooting ourselves in the foot. Uh, and that is a discussion we still have to have in Europe. Last uh, remark I wanted to make, I totally agree with you, um, and we should have learned that uh, with Russia's full-scale invasion of uh, uh, Ukraine and uh, our policy of uh, using export controls as a means of sanctioning. What we have seen there is that is, there we have a clear lack of a European approach. This is every country insisting on its national security competence. Fine, you can do that. You have the law on your side. But the reality is that whatever export control a European country introduces has ripple effects throughout the single market. So, um, and then of course, if you know you have the other country reacting to export controls we take by retaliatory measures, then of course, the country that has taken the measure in the first place turns around and says, Europe, now you have to protect us. So I really think that we have to have a discussion about how can we, while respecting the competence of member states for their national security, have a more European approach to issues such as export control. Because I agree, we look at these technologies, most of these foundational technologies lend themselves to a civil a military fusion, and that is something we need uh, uh, to deal with. But here the discussions with the member states are sometimes extremely difficult, uh, because they are very protective of their competence, whereas I think we should rather look at what are we trying to achieve politically and how can we best get there. Based on everything we've heard right now, uh, Mr. Chen's resilience is your topic. Um, what are the first steps to do? What should we do to balance all of those things that we've heard? So the first I would uh, like to <clears throat> sorry I would like to uh, say is that I fully agree with the message on openness that you've been given. Um, I think we have also we have to keep in mind what the first best policy is and what's the second best policy. And in my view, the first best policy is to improve the investment environment here so that we can free companies to 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 build those technologies with which they can earn money in the future, right? And they will they will be the ones well. I mean, they are the ones who are, which are likely uh, to, to increase growth and prosperity in Europe as well. This does not work for those technologies where you've got huge economies of scale, like the uh, AI and the cloud infrastructure and so on. There, it's much more difficult to start from a position when you've already fallen back and try to recover it. But it works, I'm sure, for many, uh, many of the other uh, technologies. For me, resilience is um, not something that is in contrast to efficiency. I mean, it may sound like it at the moment because we have to invest in climate adaptation, for example, which increases costs, but in the first place, it doesn't give you any return for it. But if you think about investments um, that go into more efficient use of energy or investments that go into uh, that go into renewable energy generation, then these certainly increase our resilience against geopolitical crises that drive up oil prices, and we've got enough of them, um, and against um, dependence on, on fossil fuels uh, more generally. And at the same time, they give us this positive supply shock, uh, shock because our energy prices will go down, not right now. And I mean, there's a side angle to it, which is how, com how the electricity uh, market works in Europe, you know, who, which, which sector determines the marginal price of electricity. But at some point, we will have enough renewable energy, energy generation so that it's the renewables which will set the price and not the gas turbines that you, yeah, that you have to switch on to, to, um, to, to satisfy the peak demand. So it, 
There are in some aspects, there might be a conflict between resilience and efficiency, but like climate adaptation, but I think in many, many areas there's no contradiction between the two. We are talking about prosperity, but uh, our audience wonders if uh, you have any thoughts on degrowth, and I will keep it as an open uh, question. If you can imagine that sustainability means more modesty, maybe, not to spend so much, not to enjoy so much. Anyone? Mr. Rushek, please. No, just to say, um one aspect that is we haven't i mean you covered it a little a little bit now uh, we are now also starting to look at uh, the demand side of uh, the energy transition and so europe uh, overall uh, households uh, also companies fare better in europe in terms of they could do better but o overall as you know we have in most countries better insulated homes than in some other countries um, so, but private sector overall is working a lot on increasing the efficiency of energy use. So, so let's say decreasing the demand uh, of the system that is that is in transition. Uh, so, just, this is part of actually what uh, you mentioned as well. But overall, I, of course, I personally believe that it is important to create value, and so uh, uh, that that. Uh, Kind of that economic theory, I think, is 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 important. Uh, uh, but how do we do that so that it is inclusive? It is uh, really uh, thought through in terms of also um, vulnerable communities. Again, if you look at uh, just the, I don't know if they still have it, but in the UK cabinet, they they had they had at one point secretary for leveling up, uh, and I think that is that is actually symptomatic of many other countries' similar issues. Um, and so I think just paying attention to what kind of growth, uh, what kind of growth do we want, that is inclusive, that is uh, the, the inclusive in 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 um, very holistic sense, just to say that geographically, but also socially, um, growth that is of course uh, decoupled, increasingly decoupled from natural uh, depletion of natural resources, extremely important, uh, and I think we're working on that. Uh, one thing I just wanted to mention here also, um, I don't know who said it, I think it just requires time because I feel if I, so my main job at the World Economic Forum is that I prepare the Davos meeting in January, okay? So every year uh, I have to kind of think through, okay, what is it that we want to actually tackle? We have teams, blah, blah, you know, we, we work with different people. And I s remember last year in the summer, you know, just just remember where we were in Europe, uh, runaway prices on energy and food. People were predicting imminent recession in major economies in Europe. Um, th there were other fears, of course, uh, there was war. I mean, we still have war in Ukraine, but there was, of course, the, the, the acute shock of the, of the war in Ukraine. And I think, for example, on the energy picture, you mentioned it. Yes, we are. it's not done. But I think we've 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 come a long way. If you think it's over a course of one year, Europe has been able to uh, somewhat control the price environment. Um, it's it takes time to be able to put together the infrastructure for the uh, for uh, you know EVs for hydrogen powered trucks, whatever you name it. These things take time. You need to also create markets for it. Uh, and so I just wanted to say that because people sometimes want to say, okay, we need solutions tomorrow. Similarly on trade, I don't know, I, I follow more the US uh, thing on trade. So obviously Jake Sullivan has this famous small yard high fence. But then if you actually read the pieces he puts out, they're still working on it. No one knows what parts of AI are going to be uh, safe enough to, to, so that there, is no, no, there are no these spillovers. Uh, but um, there are many fields where people conduct business uh, between the United States and China. I think we had, what, $800 billion record year in U.S.-China relations. I think EU-China is, what, even bigger? Nine, I think $900 billion would be. So it's still just to want to make sure that yeah, there is a lot of talk of decoupling, but we have uh, record volumes of trade. Uh, but I, and people are working through those issues. What are the lanes where we can conduct business? I do think that overall, 
the more competitive environment is here to stay, but I also think it takes time to figure out where you, where you can play. And hopefully that space where we can play and conduct business is as big as possible because as you know, I think the IMF and the World Trade Organization put out some numbers that it would cost us, I think, 7% of global GDP if we have protracted fragmentation of the global economy. And obviously, uh, that is inflationary as well, and, uh, and of course, hitting the most vulnerable in our society. So overall, I just wanted to maybe just say that the, the solution space is very good, and I think everyone should be working on that, but it's also quite difficult, and it takes time. So just to say that. Can I come back to the no growth? Uh, sure, question? sure, just sure. For, just in two sentences. So I think when, when, uh, at least when I, but I think, it, I'm sure it's similar for you, when we advocate investment and growth, it's not because we think about the desire, the, the, the benefits of having bigger cars and greater factories and whatever. <clears throat> but the thing is growth creates resources and we need enormous resources right now for the green transition to prevent climate change, right? And we don't have much time for that. We do need time for many of those markets and products to develop. And we've, we've mentioned it before. But so this is the first big area where we need resources and they need to be generated. The second big area where we need resources is pensions. Right? If we don't have substantial productivity growth over the next 20 years with population aging, our standard of life, or that, you know, that at least of the older generation of us and of the youngest as well, somewhere the money has to come from, right? They, we need the resources to support um, the aging um, of society. And then in a more uh, short-term vision, um, it's, it, it just happens to be the case that if you've got growth, sectoral changes become easier because you create new opportunities in areas that are increasing and that gives people who work in areas that are declining um, a, a chance to continue their professional career elsewhere. So lowering consumption is not the way for now today? Yes, I would say it, it could be because what we need is to spend these resources on investment, not necessarily to increase our consumption. Right? Thank you so much for, for saying that. Um, I would like to go back to um, agreements of trade that European uh, Union conducts. Uh, will the Commission take a more pragmatic or value-based approach on the global stage regarding trade and investment? And I read in one, I know it's a complicated question, and I read in one uh, article that you said that uh, EU cannot only trade with like-minded mm -hmm. countries. So will we see a shift in that? Well, I think this also goes back to a point that you made in your introductory remarks. How much are we willing to put on the table in order to get third countries to accede to what we want from them? And I think maybe that is the way to look at this. Uh, what do we offer and what do we ask from other countries? Um, and I would say that um, until recently, until the shock uh, of this changed geopolitical environment has set in, we were under the illusion that it would be enough to say we have the biggest, most affluent single market in the world. In order to accede to it, you also have to buy into our standards, you have to follow our practices. There's a conditionality of access. Um, that may work with partners that are a lot smaller because in trade, size matters. And access to the single market for smaller countries is extremely important. But now we are discussing with Mercosur, we are discussing with India, and these countries look at us and say, Europe is an aging continent. Your growth is low. Your innovation is not impressive. Why should we care? And I think sometimes it's very healthy to have a look at yourself through the lens of how other people are seeing you. And I think that leads to a more pragmatic approach where we say, what is it we really try to achieve? So we need access to certain raw materials for the green transition. These are predominantly outside the EU and not necessarily in like-minded countries. Can we still build reliable partnerships with countries even if they are not fully aligned with our way of seeing the world? Um, and I think we would, we would argue, yes, that is possible. And then we have to say, what do they, these countries want? Well, they don't want to just export their raw materials. They want to move up the value chain. They want to have investment. 
Can we help with that? That is exactly what is behind the approach of Global Gateway. That is behind the approach we've taken with Chile uh, on our uh, recently concluded uh, trade agreement. So that is what we are looking at. The other lesson we have to learn is that we can only solve the climate challenge, the sustainability challenge, through cooperation. Not just through unilateral instruments where we expect the rest of the world to fi follow our way of regulation. We are learning that the hard way now with the deforestation regulation. It's a perfectly legitimate objective for the EU to say we do not want to contribute to the deforestation of the Amazon through our consumption in the EU. So, you know, we only let products in that uh, are uh, safe from that point of view, deforestation free. But then the countries come and say, say, well, first of all, you do not have the monopoly of good regulation. And secondly, you have not taken into account what that means for my smallholders, what that means for small businesses. This comes with an enormous amount of red tape. And that is why, for instance, in the context of now, as we are trying to finalize the agreement with Mercosur, we are sitting down with them and say, OK, what would it take? What are you doing? Because we now have, for instance, a Brazilian government that takes deforestation seriously. What have you already done? What are the tracing mechanisms you've put in place? Can we recognize them under our deforestation legislation? We need to have a more cooperation-based approach. The rest of the world does not take kindly to Europe throwing around its weight. Yeah, and they, we hear more and more, and not just from developing countries, complaints about regulatory imperialism on the side of the EU. We have to take that seriously, because all the challenges we face, um, and we've been discussing about many of them today, we will only tackle them through cooperation. And cooperation only works if you treat your partners as equal. Um, and that, I think, is something where we have some margin of improvement, I would say. Mr. Schmidt, you look like you want to react. Um, just, to, just to complement on that, uh, we also have some, I would say, natural advantages in that regard. We are an aggregation of 27 member states. We internally need transparency and equality of treatment by construction, because otherwise Europe would not function. And typically, it's something we, the academic literature has found in terms of competition regulation. Europe, for that reason, is fairer in the treatment of foreign partners than any, I mean, in competition, the benchmark is usually the United States, but overall, than any large power. Because by construction, we cannot discriminate against one another, because that was the reason why we created the European Union in the first place. And typically, in terms of green cooperation, the, so I'm, I'm uh, veering outside of my Chinese expertise and back to my trade and sustainable expertise back in the French administration. But uh, um, what has been interesting is by setting, indeed, annoying extra green barriers to trade for our partners, we have also opened um, or created leverage and opened venues for cooperation. Um, and that's not an easy path forward, but typically if you look at deforestation or even critical um, uh, raw materials, the smaller cooperative agreement with some African country, um, Zambia uh, and uh, Gambia, I think, for critical raw materials, and Ghana and Cameroon uh, for deforestation, are good illustration on when indeed we create barriers, if we are smart enough, we can in those barriers create the loopholes will be too negative, but the, the, the capacity to bring in partners and to have cooperation regarding uh, recognition of certification or procedures to, I mean, so that the barrier not only creates a barrier, but actually is a, um, serves as fostering cooperation in area, typically on uh, environment and maybe tomorrow on security, where the first best option is cooperation. The issue is, if you do not put pressure on your partners, most of the time the inertia takes over and not much happen. By creating the barriers, the value is, and I, I'm not overlooking the, the risk that is associated with that, but there is an upside, that is you create incentives for your partner to come to the table and to join a fair conversation on how to integrate those certification procedures and those cooperation structure. 
One of the most important partners, obviously, is China these days. And the question is, uh, what do we really know about Chinese economy? Could you briefly just, I know, I know, <laughs> just in a minute or two, if um, the question from our audience is, is, isn't it a bubble where they will be old before being rich? Is it a bubble or is it a so real thing? They will be old before being rich. Um, irrespective of the completely astonishing, abnormal, extraordinary four decades of growth, China is lagging behind other development paths of East Asian economy and is getting older faster. So it's most likely that no, China will not reach the level of development of Japan and even less so of the United States. The most recent IMF forecast even put it on track to never catch up the nominal GDP of the United States. This is the current state. Nevertheless, even a not super performing China is still a 1.4 billion people China that has a GDP around 15 to 25% of the world GDP. Okay, so even a not super rich China is still a very big and a very powerful China. Now, regarding the question of what we know of China, there is this very famous article from 2016 when I was really del diving into China that struck me and that says the more you know, the more you understand you don't know. Um, and I think it's important to acknowledge that this is also the case of what we call Junan Hai, which is the Chinese White House, or the, uh, which is also the case for the Chinese leadership. China is a gigantic country, extremely decentralized, with a non-liberal political system that does not foster free flow of information. Internally, they probably do not know many stuff as well. And this is a reality that we have to acknowledge. And unfortunately, uh, I think COVID was one illustration of that. Yes, they probably in many ways could have done better, but there is also the byproduct of having a very opaque and complex and decentralized system um, in, that creates uncertainty and opacity almost by nature. Um, now, just to conclude on what we know, um, unfortunately, China is getting more and more opaque under Xi Jinping, so we are getting less and less, uh, I would say, non-biased information, or rather f free would be too strong of a word here, um, but yeah, a reliable information. Um, however, they are still performing astonishingly well in sectors where they want to focus on, or at least they are able to channel an awful lot of resources to those sectors in a, quite, in a smarter way than they used to do before. Um, and here may be one uh, idea that I want people to, to, to have in mind uh, after that intervention is that a more statist China is not a USSR 2.0 China. They are ambitioning to develop a much smarter, much more complex system where the state really harness market forces to guide it to the service of the Communist Party's objective, which is, unfortunately, techno-industrial self-sufficiency with sometimes uh, uh, some shades of very nationalistic uh, dimension that are not reassuring. Sometimes. China is a big country. It's complex. There is not just one China. There are very different Chinas. Um, and depending on who you talk to or depending on the dynamic of the growth of the day, you might hear very different uh, um, nar narrative of very different signal. What is difficult to know is what is the reality at the central of power? What is the narrative that dominate in Xi Jinping's head? And that is extremely difficult because we are facing a communist, Leninist, opaque power. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Mr. Dushek, uh, private money is sometimes the best indicator of opportunities in this world. So regarding this, where are the money flowing now? Where are the opportunities? What regions should we look for and to invest in? What are most interesting places from this regard? Um, just uh, so obviously it, you're right. Um, it is a fast changing geography, economic geography out there, uh, different growth markets. Um, I don't want to pick any winners here, etc. I think people know, for example, right now, uh, there is a lot of um, attention being paid to India and to uh, some other economies also in Southeast Asia. Obviously, there are certain companies that are making China plus one decisions around uh, production, for example. Um, and then, of course, so, so I could I could go on on countries, and and that can change fr from also from one year to another. Uh, obviously, some of the some of the big things we covered, I think, is more 
where I would focus it's where, where in terms of the the areas sectors etc where where investment goes uh, but if you allow I just wanted to uh, build a little bit on the European gateway because I think there I do feel that that's actually our partnerships have always been Europe's strength uh, I, of course, you're right, and it's great that there is um, this up the, the the way people are, you know, like you thinking about it and how to really make it um, even better and balanced, etc. I think it's really welcome. But just to say that again, if you just look at then some other um, frameworks that are there, um, I think um, the, the European partnership framework is very successful. And one thing I just wanted to share with you, what I liked is that I was um, I was in Central Asia in one country, and so there we were talking about the Middle Corridor, and there were all kinds of leaders there, and um, and then from there I went to I went to uh, Dubai on something else, and I was talking to this business leader who I'm known for a while, and uh, and he just told me, oh, I'm there as well. I'm you know I'm investing in the the European efforts there. I think I can't remember whether it was an EIB uh, funded or EBRD funded thing, but just to say, I think that what I think is quite special is that, uh, and I think that's the strength, is that if you have actually private sector entities that can compete for these things and be part of some of these larger infrastructure and, uh, frameworks, of course it's maybe EU funded, but then you really open it up, it's an open system where others can compete based on merit. I think that's a huge strength. And I was actually surprised by the fact that he was invested there, uh, but just wanted to mention that. Um, and then if I, if you may, just on the growth thing, one thing that I think is also important, why it is important that we do grow, is that we do have a, uh, of course, very shrunk uh, fiscal space after COVID. That is also being, you, of course, then we need investment, but just COVID meant that uh, our fiscal space is much, much smaller than before. Um, we have also a huge issue of uh, debt uh, in a lot of emerging markets. And so uh, uh, everything that was said about growth is important, but just to say that even for that reason, it's super important that we don't lose sight of how we can grow. And as you know, we live in a historically a very low growth environment, 3% globally is a very low growth environment. We used to average 3.8, 3.9. So uh, we really need to do something about that. Thank you so much for your thoughts. Unfortunately, 75 minutes is over. I know we could be talking for hours more, but unfortunately we cannot. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much for joining us. Sabine Vajan, François Schmidt, Mirek Dusek, and Johan Schanz were my guests. Thank you so much, and I hope we got it right. We had the goals set right. And uh, yeah, good luck to all of us. <laughs>